First of all, let me introduce myself. I'm Bill Bonner, I'm the chairperson of the Scottish Socialist Party. I welcome to this meeting um, organised by the Glasgow South Branch of the Scottish Socialist Party. Uh, as people will know, the SSP is an integral part of the Yes campaign and has been campaigning day in and day out uh, for a Yes vote. But I think we also bring a distinctive voice to the Yes campaign, and that's the voice of socialism. So, in furtherance of that, we've been organising a whole range of public meetings up and down the country um, under the title of the Socialist Case for Independence. Um, the meetings have been going on now um, an average about once a week, sometimes more than that, all over the country. I think we've held about 30 odd meetings so far. And in the south side, the Glasgow South Branch has already held meetings this year in Gorbals, Govan Hill, and today in Govan, and we have a programme for future meetings. Um, as I say, we, I think we bring a distinctive voice to the campaign, which is not only to argue for the maximum vote in, in September for yes, but to bring that socialist perspective to the campaign. With that in mind, we've um, got a good range of speakers today. I'll just introduce them very briefly and, and say just a little bit about how we're going to proceed with the meeting. Um, here we have Caroline sorry, I'm Mockford. Um, who's uh, from Govan is a local anti poverty campaign and community activist. She'll speak for a few minutes. We also have Caroline Perez, who's an SSP member, also a, a local resident of Govan. Um, we also have Colin Fox, who's the national spokesperson of the Scottish Socialist Party. He'll speak next. We'll then maybe have some sort of break for questions, discussion. We'll, we'll judge that near the time of politicians. Well, one of the big beasts of Scottish politics in the last many, many years, a former MP and a real champion of the left has been Jim Sillers and it's been a delight to have Jim been so involved and so influential in this campaign. So, a well, warm welcome to Jim. Well, I am just an old age pensioner who wanders around this country talking to folk at meetings, as I told George Galloway. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really surprised that so many folk have come here, because according to Joanne Lamont, the leader of the Labour Party in Scotland, we are not genetically programmed to make political decisions in our country. That means that you and me are thick. There's no other way to put it. If you're not genetically programmed, then you're really quite unique in this world because everybody else is. And just think of this. Suppose Colin Fox had said that about folk in England or Wales or France or Alex Salmond had said it. There would be banner headlines in every newspaper in Scotland. He'd be dragged in, him and Alec would be dragged in to every television and radio station and asked to justify a statement of that particular kind. But it would appear that you can say anything you like about the Scottish people. You can denigrate our ability. You can tell us we're too weird, we're too small, too inadequate to run our own affairs and apparently that's an acceptable orthodox point of view. Well, I don't see it that way. I've been in Scottish politics since 1961 and I've been a trade unionist and an official of the Scottish TUC and I have always found, if I can borrow a trait from George Galloway and be lacking in modesty. <laughs> I have always found us among the most intelligent people. In the trade union movement in my time, there was a disproportionate number of magnificent trade union leaders drawn from Scotland. Our political class was always ahead of everybody else in the United Kingdom in our ideas. So I don't go along with Joanne. She might be genetically not programmed, the rest of us are. <laughs> Colin mentioned what the other no-side are saying. 
that we have the best of both worlds. And he demolished the idea that Holyrood was part of the best of both worlds. You know, there's something like 30 billion of a budget in Holyrood at the present time. But that's not 30 billion to spend as they would like. 90% of it is pre-committed. Under statute, you have to pay for education, you have to pay for the NHS, police, fire, and all the rest of it. Only 10% is what they call discretionary expenditure, that you can do something different with. We're now being told <coughs> that there's a new deal on the table. You'll get a prize if you vote no. You'll be able to have 40% of the Hollywood budget at our disposal. That means that 60% of it is controlled from elsewhere. Not a terribly good deal on offer, as far as that's concerned. Plus, they might make promises of that to us in Scotland, but we will not decide whether we've got 40% of the expenditure, because as Enoch Powell once said famously, devolution is power retained at Westminster. We will have to ask them to give us the 40%, and if they say no, you get nothing at all beyond what we've got at the present time. That's one side of the best of both worlds. The other is this standing under the broad shoulders of the United Kingdom. You've all heard that, you know, we've got to stay there because the UK is big, strong and powerful. It's a lie. Put it in its historical context. We're talking about the final stages of the decline of the English stroke British Empire. It happens to all empires. Happened to the Persian Empire, Alexander the Great, the Romans, the Portuguese, the Spanish, the French. Now we're at the nether end of the English stroke British Empire. Has anybody in here ever asked yourself, why was the Queen at the Jubilee on that wee boat sailing up the Thames with the Duke of Edinburgh dressed as an admiral of the fleet? The reason is quite simple. In every other jubilee, the monarch reviewed the fleet. There's no fleet to review because they haven't got the money any longer. They're building an aircraft carrier between here and Fife and they haven't got the money to put aircraft on the aircraft carrier. The national debt of the United Kingdom is heading for £1.55 trillion pounds in 2016-2017. Individual private debt in this economic model, that's for credit cards, mortgages and unsecured loans to individuals, is now £1.4 trillion. Pounds. It cannot pay its own way in this world. It is, to sum up in one word, skint. And we are being asked to stay in that skint United Kingdom. And there's a price to be paid for that. They're not talking about it this side of May next year, when the Westminster election is to be held. After that election, they've got to tackle the £1.55 trillion pounds worth of debt. £25 billion pounds worth of cuts in the public sector come after May next year, and there'll be more £25 billion and more £25 billion after that. That's what will happen to us if we stay with the skint United Kingdom. So it's hardly the best of both worlds. What we need is an independent Scotland that comes away from that failed organisation. We have to think for the first time in 300 years of Scottish state interests. We haven't done that before. That's what we've got to think about. Then the working class. 
has got to think about their position. And I'm going around the country. I was asked last night in Mother, what have you got to say to the centre-right? And I said, I'm speechless with the centre-right. I don't know what to say to them. But I know what to say to the Scottish working class who are in the majority of this country and have never exercised majority rights. The most important thing for a working class person is whether or not we've got the ability to sell our labour. We have no inherited wealth. We've either got our intellectual ability or our physical ability. And if we can't sell our labour, we're in effect. We are in fact subjects of the state who can do anything they like with us. And that's happening at the present time. If someone is unemployed and they have an interview at a job centre at 2.30pm on a Thursday and they turn up at 4 o'clock, maybe because somebody in the house was ill or they weren't feeling well or they missed a bus, they're sanctioned and benefits are withdrawn. And we now have people in our country who have no ability to sell their labour at the present time who are destitute in this country. That's never happened before in my lifetime. So this issue, can we sell our labour, is determined entirely by the economic policy that's pursued. And so we have to have in an independent Scotland, an economic policy designed entirely for the working class so that they can sell their labour at a good rate in the market. That's the policy that I'm advocating and Collins advocating for an independent Scotland. And we can get it because we are the majority. The people who will deliver a yes vote in this campaign are the working class of Scotland because they've got the most to gain from a yes vote. And how do we get that full employment? How do we create jobs? Collins right. There's work crying out to be done all over this country. We have 157,000 families on the housing waiting list. How do you cure that? It's no rocket science. You build houses. If you don't build houses, they remain on the house and waiting list. And if you start building houses, 25, 30,000 houses a year, somebody's got to quarry the sand, somebody's got to make the cement, somebody's got to make the bricks, somebody's got to deliver them to the sites. You've got to have bricklayers and their apprentices, joiners, plumbers, slaters, to build the houses. And throughout that trail, you've created jobs all over the place. Now, how do you pay for it? Well, there's a thing called the Private Finance Initiative. It's going to cost us, if we don't alter the contracts, £22 billion. Pounds. We'll pay to them. If we have a socialist government in an independent Scotland, you call them in and you say, We'd like to renegotiate the contracts. Oh, they say, we don't want to do that. And you say to them, look, in the commercial world, isn't it true that contracts are renegotiated every day in the week, as they are? If one partner to a contract is in a different position than originally with the other partner, then they renegotiate. And you bring them in and you say, we want you to renegotiate. And they say no. And you say, well, there's no problem. We'll just pay you a year in arrears. Not on the amount of wages now, but in arrears. And if you don't like that, we'll tax you 30% on the 22 billion. And if you don't like that, there's nothing you can do about it because we've got the power in the independent Scottish Parliament and that's how it's going to be. And you take that money that's being spent now outside of our country and you use it to build houses. What we need is an economy built on our resources. And Colin's right, the greatest resource we have is our people. 
And within that people, the greatest resource we have is our children. Is everybody in here aware that the private schools in Scotland, like Hutchies, like Watson's in Edinburgh, and Gordonston and all the rest of it, have an 80% reduction in their council tax. Has everybody ken that? Are you all aware of that? They get that under the Charities Act because they're supposed to do and claim to do public good outside of education of this, the children in that private school. State schools don't get any reduction. In Edinburgh, in Fetties, where Blair was educated, their council tax liability is £209,000. They pay £41,000. At the other end of the city of Edinburgh is a deprived area called Wester Hills. 40% of the wains in that school are in free school dinners. Their council tax liability is 261,000 and they pay 261,000. What you do if you're a socialist is you look at the Charities Act and the Charities Act says the state schools don't get that reduction because the minister pays them whereas the private person pays the private school. Now the test in the Charities Act is public good. Now just think about it. Think of three people that we all know. Tony Blair, Jimmy Reid, Margaret MacDonald. Who has done the most public good? Blair from Fetties, Jimmy Reid from the Govan State School and Margaret MacDonald from Hamilton Academy. There isn't any question who's done the most public good in our society. And so, without an extra penny, you can transfer money into the state schools to give our young children a better start in life in education. But we can do more than that. We've got 32 education authorities in a small country of 5 million people. 32 bureaucracies, 32 directors of education, deputies and assistants and all the rest of it. Knock it down to five education authorities, say Strathclyde being one of them, and you can transfer £500 million pounds, the money we've got just now into the schools in order to give our children a better opportunity. In 1973, in the Scottish Grand Committee in the House of Commons, we debated a document called Born to Fail. This is 2014. There are 36,000 children in the city of Glasgow born to fail. There are 250,000 children in Scotland born to fail in 2014. We can alter that by doing what I'm advocating and what a socialist government could do in the education system. And if we give our young people that opportunity, unlike Joanne, I believe that they're not genetically programmed for anything else but to show their talent and ability. Then there's another resource that it's a bit uncomfortable to talk about in Scotland, and that's the oil. We're a remarkable nation, you know. We're the only developed nation that ever discovered oil and our people got poorer. That's a remarkable factor. We're also the only nation where we're told that the discovery of oil is a problem, not an asset. And if you listen to the, the Better Together people, they'll tell you uh, the price is volatile. It can go down. It can go up as well, as it has done in the past and will do in the future. But they've kept us in ignorance. We've been kept in a prison of lies about the oil industry since the first drop ever arrived on the mainland. There's a man called Gavin McCrone, who was the top economist in the Scottish office in the days of early oil, who wrote a memorandum for the government saying 
that we would be among the richest nations in the world if Scotland got its hands on the oil. That was kept secret. There was no freedom of information in those days. And while he was telling them that privately, every public statement by Labour Tory Liberal was that the oil was the important. It would go away. We couldn't put all our eggs in the oil basket. Janie Buchan, who was an MEP for Labour, was on television one night and said it can't be Scotland's oil. We didn't put it there. I, I, I've worked in the Arab world and I've told my Arab friends that. And they fall about laughing and they say we didn't put it there either. But why, geez, we can't wait to do it. And we, Harry Selby, debating with Margot and Govan, repeated what Jenny Buchan said. So they've been trying to tell us it's not important. And the fact is that they've been successful because the Scottish population knows nothing about the oil industry. The other night in Edinburgh, a public meeting, I was berated by a member of Collins' party for not advocating the nationalisation of the whole of the North Sea. And I said, we don't have the human capacity to be able to nationalise it and run it. And the guy thought he'd trump me. Oh, he says, that's not true. There are thousands of workers in the North Sea. You know, and they'll know about the industry. They don't. They know about the rig that they work on. And when they come off the rig to the mainland, they disperse. That's why there's not the same as we had in the shipbuilding industry, in the coal mining industry. In the steel industry, we had mining towns, shipbuilding towns and steel towns where folk met in the pubs and the clubs and talked about their industry and therefore was a body of knowledge built up about those industries. But when you disperse that workforce, there are 570 rigs in the North Sea. You disperse those men, they don't give their knowledge into the community and anyway their knowledge is limited to their particular right. We have been kept deliberately ignorant, which is why I advocate a Scottish National Oil Corporation so that we have not just a hand in the oil but a window into that industry. And all the debates that we have about oil are about the tax revenue, whether it will go up and whether it will be doing. What I want you to think about is the black stuff itself. It's a resource. What we could do with the actual black stuff that comes to Grangemouth and is refined. Suppose we took a small proportion, and we're only five million people, so we'd only need a small proportion of the actual production of oil. And we used it to reduce the price of petrol, the price of diesel, and the price of jet fuel for aircraft you would immediately put more money into the pockets of families to spend in the localities. But more important, you would make our transport industry one of the most efficient because of low cost in the whole of Europe. You would improve the tourist industry's prospects enormously. A big part of our tourism comes from the north of England. Man, wife, two wings, family car, they hardly go beyond Edinburgh and Glasgow line because once you pass that line, long distances, a lot of fuel consumption and very expensive for a family. Imagine the difference it would make to the tourist industry in terms of job creation if in fact those folk come across the border and discovered it's very cheap to go all over Scotland. And we would be able to create a huge number of new jobs and imagine what we can do for Edinburgh and Glasgow airports where we're trying to get direct air services to key parts of the world if in fact we could deliver lower jet fuel costs which is a big factor for any airline. You're starting to create jobs all over the place simply by a better use of that resource because we would in fact own it. Then there's the small medium sized enterprises in Scotland. We've got 340,000 small companies. The banks don't want to know them. I go for a Saturday morning coffee and a bacon roll with one of my grandsons in Edinburgh. And the woman who runs the cafe is a working class lassie who would like to expand a bit and employ somebody, but she needs something like 20 or 30,000 pounds. Not a bank will look at her. 
I said to her, phone them up and ask for 20 million. You'll get an interview, you'll not get the money, but you'll certainly get an interview because there's bonus in the 20 million. What we need to create is a small, medium-sized enterprise bank specifically to deal and service those 340,000 companies. And just think of this, if only half of them create one extra well-paid job, then we're on the way to creating that full employment that should be the desire of the Scottish working class. That's the kind of thing we can do, but we'll only be able to do it if we're independent. There's not a snowball's chance in hell of us being able to do that, being tied to the United Kingdom. Sending down from Scotland the lobby fodder of Labour MPs time after time after time. Does anybody in here read the Daily Telegraph? Come on Liam, you must read the Daily Telegraph. I knew, I knew Liam read the Daily Telegraph, he's not a Tory. I read the Daily Telegraph because I want to know what the other side are thinking. Three weeks ago, knowing that most of us up here don't read the Daily Telegraph, Ed Miliband wrote an article. And it was all about middle England, the middle class in England, and how he was very concerned about their position. And if he became Prime Minister, they would be his number one priority. And they'll come up here and tell us if we vote no, they'll sing the old songs about stay with Labour, and down there they'll be farming the English middle class vote. And if they get in, it'll be English middle class priorities that we get. We won't get the things that we actually think we voted for. So it's important that the Scottish working class realise that it's only with independence will we get the kind of policies that we want and our people need. Equality, I just want a, a couple of words on equality. I see no reason why when the Scottish independent parliament is formed and there's a socialist government, we don't make the living wage mandatory in the public sector from day one. No reason whatsoever. And also to start rebalancing this question of inequality, we should have a policy that says in the public sector, no one at the top will ever earn more than 13 times what the person at the bottom gets instead of the 140, 200 times that's the position at the present. We'll start to create a better balanced equality in our society. Now how do we do it? Well I would like to see more working class persons standing for Parliament. At the moment, out of the 129 at Hollywood, there's only 32 didn't they go to university. Now that's no denigration of university. I'm happy if my grandchildren go to university. But we've got a new political class that's developed that went to university, became a researcher for an MP or an MSP, and then became an MSP. Where working class people are not in the running. Now when we are independent, you've got to be in the running. You've got to be the people when, it was like in my generation, we were drawn from the working class and therefore took working class experience into that parliament and argued for working class policy. That's a challenge for everybody in this room and the whole of Scotland and the Scottish working class. Start participating, start demanding your rights, start knowing that you've got leadership capabilities. Let me tell you a story. Again, it's the George Galloway trait of lack of modesty. In 1979, John Smith, Margaret MacDonald and me went to debate at the Oxford Union. And after the debate was over, and there they all were, these eaten ox educated boys and lassies. And I was walking out with the president of the Oxford Union. And I said to him, where do I pick up my PhD? And he says, what? I said, where do I get my PhD? I don't understand you, he said. I said, listen, if you're the creme de la creme in there, then I'll tell you something. I'm so much better than you, my PhD must be waiting at the door. Now that's a lack of modesty, some would say. But I found myself educated at Newton Park Primary School 
an air academy, left without a certificate, but learned a lot in the trade union movement, I was ten times better than any of them. And it's high time we threw off this cloak of modesty in the Scottish working class and stood up, looked in the mirror and said, I am as good, in fact, I'm better than lots of other people who would rule over us. trying to do and my contribution to this campaign is inject into the minds of the working class people of Scotland that you have a latent power that you have never used. You have the enormous talent that you sometimes fail to recognise. You have got to use that power and recognise your talent and bring them together in a combination that makes you the governing force in this country. That's the purpose, the main purpose, that I'm arguing about beyond a yes vote. Now, can I finally end by saying this? I've written a book, which is a socialist programme for an independent Scotland. No pie in the sky stuff, something that can be done. And some of my friends said to me about one part of it, don't put it in, Jim, focal market. But I listened and others said, no, I'll put it in, and I put it in. And in that book, I point out that there are two aircraft carriers. One the Royal Navy can put crew on, the other they don't care what to do with. They would love to sell it. Argentina would love to buy it, but obviously can he sell it to them. So what do they do with it? I've said, we'll take it. An independent Scotland will take it. We'll take that second aircraft carrier. We will not put armaments on it, we will not send it to sea to kill people. We will convert it, and if the folk in government are looking for work, this is the kind of work you can get, we will convert it into a hospital and rescue ship. There is a ship called the Africa Mercy, 16,500 tonnes, which does work in the poorest parts of Africa. The 16,500 tonnes. They've got operating theatres and do 3,300 surgical operations. They improve wings that have got cataracts, for example, cleft palates. Imagine a wing in a poor African village with those handicaps, and those handicaps are taken away, the transformation of the lives that take place. And I've said, right, instead of building warships, Instead of taking an aircraft carrier and putting weapons to kill people and sailing off to kill people, let us put it out as a hospital ship so that for the first time since we were in the Union, instead of sending our young men and women out to kill people, we send them out to heal people. Imagine what that would do to Scotland's international reputation when we become independent. What they're telling us, they told us, you'll lose influence in the world. This was Dougie Alexander, the Shadow Foreign Secretary. You'll lose influence. How much better influence would it be if we heal people and not kill them? An old miner in Nether Third and Cumnock at a meeting was at many years ago summed up the problem of the Scottish working class better than anyone I've ever heard. He said, The great problem is that all our socialist dreams have been destroyed by the London connection. And it's absolutely true. Well, if we cut the London connection with independence, we don't need to dream. We can make a better country and a better nation for our young people. Not a dream, but a reality. And if that's to happen, between the hours of 7 a.m. and 10 p.m. on the 18th September, we, the Scottish people, for the first time ever, will be absolutely sovereign in those 15 hours. We will make the sovereign decision about our country. 
If at one minute past ten we have voted yes, we have kept that sovereignty, that dream becomes a reality. And for the Scottish working class, the cry can go out that night, our time has finally come. I'll just introduce now Colin Fox, who is the National Spokesperson of the Scottish Socialist Party. There's no need to clap. Well, thank you very much, Bill, and uh, thanks very much to the Scottish Socialist Party and Govan for organising tonight's meeting. And uh, in particular, thanks to all of you for coming, and it's a credit to you that you're engaging in the most important issue that this country has faced for 300 years. That's the context of tonight's uh, discussion. It's a very important meeting. It's a very important issue ahead of a very important vote on the 18th of September when Scotland gets to change the course of history and make that most important decision in 300 years. And I must say at the outset of my remarks, it's a tribute to the SSP and government for, as Caroline mentioned, Carolina mentioned, 25 years ago today, Mrs Thatcher introduced the poll tax, and here we have Jim Sellers back in government to commemorate the occasion. Uh, thank goodness at least that is not here with us as well. It's my job tonight to explain why the Scottish Socialist Party supports independence and why we've done so for the past 15 years. And one thing I'd like to establish right at the very beginning is that supporting the democratic right of nations like Scotland to self-determination doesn't make you a Scottish nationalist, it makes you a democrat. This is the search for a democratic right for Scotland, an inalienable right to make our own decisions, free from outside interference, in the same way that 260 other countries in the world take that right for granted. That's all we want. We don't want any favours, we don't want any special treatment, we just want what we're entitled to as of our right. And it's also, I think, important to establish at the outset of these remarks, let's never forget that Scotland is a nation, it is a country, ours is a country. We're not a province of anywhere else, we're not a region of anywhere else, we're a defined country. And therefore we as a nation and a people are entitled to determine our own future. I think that's extremely important at the outset to establish. And why does the Scottish Socialist Party support independence? A straightforward question. The straightforward answer is because working class people like us here in Govan will be better off. That's why we support independence. We'll be economically better off. We'll be socially better off. We'll be politically better off. And that's the essence of the case I want to put in front of you today. Because we shouldn't allow anybody to tell you otherwise that Scotland is potentially one of the richest countries in the world. The OECD, based in Geneva, who have a league table of the richest countries in the world, have Scotland sitting at the eighth richest country in the world if we are in charge of our own resources, in charge of our own economy, in charge of our own decisions. And like all the wealthy countries in the world, we are a wealthy country because our wealth comes from a diverse array of different sources. Yes, we have oil and gas. And by the way, let nobody in this debate tell you that 95% of the countries in the world would give their eye teeth for Scotland's oil and gas reserves. They would. We have oil and gas. We have renewable electricity, renewable energy sources, the lights, the yellow electricity coming out of these bulbs tonight. A third of the electricity we provide in Scotland today comes from renewable energy. It has been said that Scotland could potentially be the Saudi Arabia of a renewable energy in future. We have oil and gas, we have renewable energy, we have world-class financial services, we have manufacturing and construction, we've got information technology, life sciences, tourism, world-class universities, world-class public services, and above all, our most precious asset economically is you, is the people of Scotland. That's who's the most talented 
and our most precious resource, the talented, skilled, resourceful people who live here. And it stands to reason, for socialists like me, if all the wealth generated here in Scotland, all the taxes we paid, all the national insurance you paid, all the income tax you pay, all the duty on alcohol, tobacco and petrol, all the corporation tax, capital gains tax, all the VAT, if all those taxes that we pay stayed here in Scotland instead of being siphoned off to Westminster, then it stands to reason that that great extra wealth could be used to address the shameful inequalities that both of the previous speakers have mentioned. The absolutely disgraceful and shameful child poverty in this city and others. That means one in three children in Glasgow in the 21st century are living in deprivation and poverty. That's one in three children in this city. They don't get to have a special pair of shoes for the winter months. They wear the same trainers they did in the summer. They don't get to go on the school trips. They don't get a coat in the winter that keeps out the cold. One in three children in this city in poverty in the 21st century. Every single one of us, the length and breadth of this country, ought to be and are ashamed of those statistics. We're ashamed of the fact that one in three families in this country endure the misery and the ignominy of fuel poverty. They don't have enough money to pay gas and electric bills in the 21st century. We see in Scotland all around us today food banks, the equivalent of the soup kitchens of the 1930s, revisited governing communities like it in the 21st century, where people have been handed out packets of pasta, tins of beans, packets of cornflakes, because they don't have the money to feed themselves or their family. That's an outrage and a scandal that this independence debate gives us the wherewithal and the opportunity to say no more. No more child poverty, no more fuel poverty, no more chronic low pay, no more casual employment where we have the statistic that now sees the first recession in our history where unemployment falls and is replaced by underemployment because people are losing full-time, secure, permanent jobs and are being replaced 12 and 14 hour casual, temporary, poorly paid jobs. And that reality is what we're trying to grapple with today. That's what this debate in independence <coughs> is about. It's about addressing these inequalities that face us. And we have statistics in front of us that the two previous speakers have rightly identified Scotland could potentially be the eighth richest country in the world, but currently we're locked into a United Kingdom that is the fourth most unequal country in the world, which means the gap between the richest and the poorest is widest, the fourth widest in all the world. That's not circumstances that we want to see. That's not in the social democratic and socialist tradition of working class people in Scotland. That's an affront that we want to bring to an end. And Scotland would be, with independence, politically better off because we get to make our own decisions at long last. It means there'd be no more poll tax, no more bedroom tax, no more laddies and lassies sent to govern to die in Iraq or Afghanistan for adventures for the British Empire. All those are put behind us because we get to build the kind of Scotland that we want to see. And be absolutely clear in this debate, and I'm sure you've noticed in the 18 months since it kicked off, that the British ruling class are absolutely desperate to stop Scotland becoming independent. And you might say, if you listen to the No campaign for two minutes, you'd be led to believe that Scotland is some kind of economic basket case. They were a constant drag on the resources of the United Kingdom. And you have to say to yourself, well, if that were the case, wouldn't it be true that the British ruling class would be desperate to see the back years, wouldn't they? If we're such a leech on their resources, if we're such an albatross round their neck, either thought they wanted to get rid of us. Well, of course they don't. They're desperate to keep Scotland as part of the United Kingdom because they recognise that this is a very valuable asset to them. And I noticed, I don't know if you noticed a few months ago, that great British Prime Minister, John Major. Hands up, MD, remembers him. 
Yeah, well done. Some students there have studied the issue. John Major a couple of weeks ago chastised some of his fellow Tories in the, in the Westminster Parliament for saying, well, they want independence, let them have independence, beat it, we don't need them. To which Major replied, he Scotland is independence. Where are we going to get our soldiers from? Where are we going to get our soldiers to fight our wars from? <coughs> Reminding them that Scotland has also played that role for the United Kingdom in the past. And the truth is, the Scottish working class, people like you, communities in Govan and Glasgow and Edinburgh, Aberdeen, Dundee, Lanarkshire, Renfrewshire, we are held back by the United Kingdom. That's the reality about it. They add insult to injury. And the no case is essentially to come to the good people of Govan, and I'm sure you'll have meetings of the no campaign all this week. In fact, here's a tip. If you find any meetings of no campaign, do let me know, because I've never heard of a single one in 18 months. But if there's one tomorrow night in Govan, I can guarantee Joanne Lamont or whoever else will come across and say, Colin, Scotland is better off in the Union because we get the best of both worlds. We have a strong Scottish Parliament in Edinburgh and vital influence there in London. And I apologise for the patronising voice, but that's how she speaks, isn't it? And the reality is, none of that's true. Because we don't have a strong Scottish Parliament in Westminster. I had the good grace, the great good fortune to represent the good people of the Lothians for four years at the Scottish Parliament as an MSP. And my daily experience was to go to my work and be constantly told what I couldn't talk about. Colin, no, no, you can't talk about unemployment in here. No, no, you can't talk about the economy in here. Or you can't talk about low pay in here. You can't talk about the national minimum wage in here. You can't talk about driving in here. Or Iraq. Or Afghanistan. In fact, see all the things your constituents came to see you every Friday. Virtually none of them can you talk about in here. That's for the big boys at Westminster. Because the reality is the Scottish Parliament doesn't have anywhere near the powers that we need to defend ourselves for the ravages of the bedroom tax, for the Westminster government scapegoating claimants and immigrants for a crisis caused by the bankers. We don't have the powers to confront that garbage. And that's what this debate is about. And neither do we have vital influence at Westminster. Because if we did, we didn't want the bedroom tax. We got lumbered with it. We didn't want the privatisation of the Royal Mail. We got lumbered with it. We don't want trident nuclear weapons 50 miles from this hall. We get lumbered with them. We didn't want Afghanistan and Iraq. We get lumbered with them. Because we don't have any influence at Westminster. That's the stark reality of this. And I wanted to say this to you. I was debating with Ian Davidson on the radio at the weekend. Hands up, Mendy, who heard me on the radio. <laughs> so, well done, Mia. I got up early, went all the way from Edinburgh to Dundee, thinking he was all listening to Radio Clyde between 12 and 1 on Sunday morning. Well, that way I get to tell you anything I like, because none of you heard otherwise. But I was debating with Ian Davidson on uh, Sunday morning, and he makes the point about if we have independence, British aerospace will close down government, or the shipyard go, jobs will go, and that will be the end of the uh, government and the people of government who work there. And I was reminded of this yesterday when I seen Gideon Osborne announcing that the Tory government are now in full of favour of full employment. Did you see it? And because for socialists like me and Jim Sellers and my colleagues here, I've always been in favour of full employment. Full employment's a good thing. In Scotland there's far more work to be done than we've got people to do it. But the full employment that I'm in favour of is a million light years for the slavery that George Osborne has in mind because the full employment he talks about is slave wages. No security in employment. You can be fired out the door if the gaffer doesn't like you and you can go and get another crappy job along the street. That's no full employment. That's anathema. That's an affront to working people. The full employment the Scottish Socialist Party is in favour of everybody has a job with dignity on a living wage of £9 an hour with full trade union rights, security and employment and you don't get treated like shite by an employer who treats you worse than scum. The days are over my friend Osborne. We are in favour of full employment and that extends to communities and government in particular because my view is, I grew up in Motherwell 
where the British Steel Corporation tell my granda and my father and my classmates there would always be jobs in the steelworks. If you've been to Motherwell recently, you know there's no steelworks there. British Steel Corporation never had any loyalty to the people of Motherwell in the same way that Chrysler didn't have any loyalty to the people of Linwood and British Aerospace don't have any loyalty to the people of Govan, their loyalty profits, they're no loyalty people. And the difference is, under an independent socialist Scotland, I want to see full employment is guaranteed for working people. And I have to say to you about, there's a world of difference I see in independent Scotland, we'll be build ships in the Clyde, we continue to use those skills, those tremendous skills that shipyard workers have got, we'll be build civilian ships, we're not tied into a British military industrial complex that has tarnished Scotland's reputation for centuries, sending laddies across the world to die. That we have a position today where virtually the only volume manufacturer in Scotland is related to defence industries. We are tied to a union that is the fifth biggest arms manufacturer in the world, the fifth biggest defence expenditure in the world. That's not a future Scotland I want to be part of. I want people around the world to know of Govan as a place where they built the QE2 and they built civilian ships and the peacemongering peoples of Govan. No warships and battleships, no associated with defence industries that are killing people around the world. And I have to say there are people who say, well, the defence industries, they provide jobs at Fast Lane and the rest of it. Well, I remember reading Lord Wilberforce, America, elsewhere, those people who stood up against slavery, weren't they put off their crusade by people who said, hold on, you can't abolish slavery. My members drive their slaves to market. We make the carts. We make the ankle bracelets. If you abolish slavery, my members will be put out of business, put out of work. This is a moral question. And I have to say, Scotland's history has been tarnished for centuries by an attachment to a British empire, colonial empire that exploited peoples of the world. And it's no future that we should be part of. And I wanted to say this in finishing, Bill, about another issue that tends to come up in this debate. And it really annoys me when I hear people like Ian Davison, Joanne Lamont and others talking about the politicians who talk about the burden that all people are to our nation. You hear that all the time, don't you? I'm sick to the back teeth of listening to that. They talk about Scotland, how it's been bankrupted by some demographic time bomb that sees Scots living longer. In my generation, the baby boom generation, about to bankrupt the country 10 years from now when we retire and get our pensions and bust the pension pot, apparently. And my message to people who put forward that nonsense is, you want to get real, quite frankly. Because the fact of the matter economically is, our senior citizens are a resource to this country of invaluable use. You consider the role that senior citizens play in childcare provision and looking after other senior citizens who are in care. Give guidance to teenagers, keeping them in the straight and narrow. That valuable life's advice from those problem years 1 to 81. The senior citizens that provide that role. And they're worth billions to this country. And I'm bound to say, you're going to hear in a minute from a very valuable senior citizen who's been playing to packed houses across Scotland. Something that Alistair Darling, Joanne Lamont and Gordon Brown never did in their puff, quite frankly. So I say to you, Scotland is a wealthy country that must keep the promise that we made to our senior citizens and the generations that went before us who built this country by their sweat, blood and tears, who fought for this country. And this generation has to ensure that it pays the proper respect and ensures that every single one of them has dignity and employment, dignity and retirement. And I want to say this to you in fruition. Independence, what does it mean? It means there'll be no more Tory governments. It means there'll be no more bedroom tax, cold tax, austerity, destruction of the welfare state. No more scapegoat immigrants and claimants for a crisis caused by the bankers. No more policies that we didn't support because we get what we want. We elect the governments that we want. That's the difference that, working, that independence brings to working class people. And I'm confident on the 18th of September that we're going to win a yes vote. A famous victory on the 18th of September because it's the progressive option in this referendum. And Scots have shown repeatedly, time after time after time, we choose the progressive option when it's in front of us. 
we're going to see independence. And you make yourself absolutely clear that no country that's ever voted for independence has ever voted to go back to the way things were before. We step up to the plate on the 18th of September. We build our country. We make our decisions. Rightly or wrongly, they're our decisions. We change this country forever. We change the world forever. Seize the time. Seize the opportunity. Vote yes on the 18th of September. Get involved in the Yes Scotland campaign. Join the Scottish Socialist Party. Thank you very much. Good evening everyone, thanks for coming. Um, I'm a member of the SSP um, and I'm a local activist here in Govan, I just live up the road there. I'm a normally working class mum in a low paid job within the civil service. Uh, I'm a socialist and I've always believed that Scotland should be independent, but I'm pretty sure I'm not alone when I say I'm a wee bit fed up with the way the debate's been formed around oil revenues and uh, a currency, or whether or not we will have a currency union. Whilst I know these are important issues, as I'm sure Colin and Jim will go on to explain, when I go to the polling booth on September the 18th, I'll be casting my vote based on the things that matter to me, my family, my colleagues that I work with, and those in the community that I live in. Things like the defence of public services that we all rely on, and the concern that those public services that we uh, that th those services might be privatised and sold off to the highest bidder for private companies to make a profit on. Things like a decent wage to ensure families are not struggling to make ends meet each month is the cost of living, as we all know. I don't need to tell anyone in this room, it's constantly increasing. But over and over, what we keep hearing is, Scotland's too wee, Scotland isn't strong enough, can Scotland afford to stand on its own? But the real question for me, is that can it, can it afford not to? We have the people and the resources to prosper, so why isn't Scotland doing better? When I was three years old, Margaret Thatcher was elected as Prime Minister, and throughout my childhood I experienced the full brutality of her policies, having milk snatched off us in primary school, the closure of industries in the community that I lived in that saw thousands of men and women being robbed of their livelihoods and being dumped on the scrap heap, or the communities that they live in were decimated into ghost towns, some of which have never fully recovered. 35 years on from that, I'm standing here, I've got a nine-year-old son, and I ask myself, what does his future hold? Wasn't that long ago that I got a, a letter home from his school, school just up the road there in Govan Road, um, and the letter was asking parents to contribute any spare tins or packets to a food bank because his classmates were going hungry. When I chat to other parents in the playground, we talk about rising costs with, uh, in food and fuel, not being able to make our rent payments every month and having to make a choice between heating their homes or giving their child a healthy meal. One million Scots are right now living below the breadline. Bread that figure includes disabled people, Unemployed and low paid workers having their benefits slashed, and that figure includes one in five children living in poverty. <coughs> one in five children living in poverty. This should not be happening in 2014 in what is supposedly the world's eighth richest country. So, why is it happening? The answer is really quite simple. Our parliament and our government does not have full control over its own affairs. We're at the mercy of a Westminster government that has, that has never had or never will have the interests of Scottish people at heart. A government that we never voted for. Yet we've had to suffer the consequences of their austerity measures, as they call it. Policies like the bedroom tax and, of course, the poll tax, which was implemented 25 years ago, actually today. Not a very good April Fool, if you ask me. Um, but that was implemented by Thatcher um, 25 years ago today, um, and a year before the rest of the UK got it, because we were the guinea pigs. Now, if Scotland votes no in September, we will continue to be at the mercy of a government in London. Whichever form that government takes, whether it's Labour, Tories, Lib Dem, or any unholy coalition between those three. I don't want to give anyone nightmares, but opinion polls south of the border show that the next UK election could return a Tory and UKIP coalition. 
Imagine a scenario where David Cameron, or even heaven forbid Boris Johnson, is Prime Minister and Ni Nigel Farage is the Deputy Prime Minister. For me, that's not a prospect worth thinking about. Do you honestly think that those people have the interests of Scottish working class people in mind? To me, this is where socialism comes in. Scotland doesn't face one choice. In fact, it faces many. If after independence has been won, and I actually have great faith that it will be won, which path should Scotland then go down? Will we go down the same old route of men in suit politics? No offences to anyone who's wearing a suit. Um, should we go down that road where an elite few plunder Scotland's resources for their own benefit? Or do we build an alternative vision where the values of public ownership, equality, wealth, re redistribution ensure that we don't have a statistic of one in five children living in poverty? A Scotland where health and education and justice, affordable housing are rights, not privileges that come with a hefty price tag. We can do better on our own, no matter what David Bowie, Simon Cowell or even Kermit the Bloody Frog says. For me, independence is a basic principle of democracy. The right for a country to determine its own affairs. As an activist and as a socialist, I would defend any country's right to self-determination. Why should a parliament in London tell an, an administration in Edinburgh what to do? The idea that a French government could tell a German parliament or a Spanish government could tell a, a parliament in Portugal what to do is ludicrous and it's, and it's absurd. So why should we accept it here in Scotland? I could end uh, by slagging off the Better Together campaign, but I don't need to. I think they're doing a grand job of digging themselves further into a deep hole. <coughs> if opinion polls are to, believe, are to be believed, then the momentum is with the Yes campaign. So I will end with a plea. We not only have a unique opportunity, but also a responsibility to change Scotland for the better. We can ensure that my kids and your kids never have to rely on food, food banks to make sure our pensioners don't have to make a choice between heating and eating and to create the quality of opportunity for every single person living in Scotland. We should and we must grab that chance. Vote yes is a step towards an independent socialist Scotland. Thank you. Um, I would like to share with you my personal perspective on tackling poverty successfully in the coming years. With regards to health inequalities, there will be no more postcode health lotteries with those in affluent areas no longer having operations 60% faster than those in deprived communities. Medical students will be receiving more than the 2% mental health issues training they receive now, thus decreasing the correlation between mental health issues and poverty. Doctors' fees for medical letters will have been abolished, no longer penalising those on low incomes or those with disabilities who need this service the most for benefit claims. On food poverty, man-made malnutrition and food banks caused by welfare reform have been eliminated. Bread prices are regulated like in France. Derelict land will be freely available with seeds and implements to encourage people to grow their own food to supplement their diets, benefiting people mentally, physically and financially. By addressing fuel poverty, there will be fewer earlier deaths and improvement in overall health. No more instances of heat or heat, leaving more money in people's pockets. Regarding employment, the introduction of the living wage will mean people have more disposable income, raising living standards, thus boosting the economy and creating more jobs. All apprentices will be guaranteed employment at the cessation of their training, not disregarded by employers as it is cheaper to take on new apprentices than new staff. Zero hour contracts have been outlawed and more job opportunities are available for people aged 50 and over or those with disabilities. On benefit issues, for those people with limited digital experience, paper versions are available to apply for benefits. Benefits have ridden with inflation, eradicating child poverty and ill health and disability related poverty. There will be no more bedroom tax, instead there will be a mansion tax. In conclusion, there will be a more equally just and fair society 
with stigmatisation minimalised. This is my view for Scotland in the future and it could be achieved by the proper taxation of the richest in society. Thank you. Do you want to stand up? Solidarity with the English poor, and also they've also been sort of, uh, trying to dream up the spectre of John Smith to say that this is all, uh, this is all mistaken and so on. And uh, I'm a small businessman, I'm a SNP supporter, I'm a small socialist. I think it's fantastic to be here with the SNP because I think you are the people who are best placed to actually take measures on the street that, um, that solidarity with the poor in other countries. Not the truth, uh, not the okay. Any other points? Yeah, I'd like to say, <laughs> I love Jim's idea about the hospital ship. I think that any Scottish constitution, the first thing should be like a hypocritical oath, first do no harm. You know, like it's an international policy, so it's basically you're looking at to engage with other people. Kind of social solidarity through different countries and that. But I'd like to ask, I'm a trade, former trade union rep, a shipyard electrician and all this kind of stuff. One of the biggest problems I see is gangs like myself who think they're Tories because they bought their house, or they think they're upper middle class because they bought their house. And you try and convince them and you try and badger their life at them as much as you can. But it still comes back to them. I don't like Sam and I don't like the SAP. It's all the same answers that they get off the news night, they get off the other programs. If I was watching RT the night before I came out the news, and they had a heavy some English uh, London kind of CPI type organisation, and he said Scotland's going to be like East Germany. And he was the UK channels for the newsreader. East Germany before kind of reunification. It's unbelievable. I think what we need to try and do is, it's great grassroots movements like this. But it's people who are interested who want to come to them. It's trying to get the message out there beyond mainstream media. Now, Twitter, I think, is about the best thing ever. The amount of people you see on Twitter and you find out, even Yes, Coven's doing a great job. You try and get organised around. But I think, I don't know, I mean, even like Jim's point on the bank, sorry to go on, but uh, I think, in general, saying, a national bank whereby you persuade Scottish citizens to take their money out of these corporate banks and put their money in there and just say to them, no, you want to play hardball with us? This is how we play hardball. We'll take all our mortgages, we'll take all our savings, all our debt, and we'll put it into this Scottish National Citizens Bank, which then, as people put foreign investment in, they put foreign pound, it strengthens our economy. We can go a singular, but we're in solo currency. We don't need the, the, the financial arrangement that the SNP are proposing. Okay. I will bring the, the four speakers back in for a, for a minute at the very end just to answer some of these questions. Yeah, just to follow on to what the chaps just said there. Um, I've actually got a question for the, the panel, but I'm going to go just to frame it. Um, I, uh, <coughs> like probably most people in this hall, uh, want the socialist uh, country that we've all been talking about. Uh, and certainly a few, for a long time now, I've realised that it's never going to happen in my lifetime unless we do separate from the corruption from the need of Westminster. I know that is definitely not going to happen. Um, and there's, there's probably very few people as well who are grassroots Labour supporters uh, who want the exact same thing. But it's certainly my experience talking to the clubs and taxi guys and friends and family living. There's, there's a wee bit there, in fact, a big bit there for some of them, where the, the sort of match up a vote for yes has been a, a vote for SNP and Alex Salmon. And uh, when you actually discuss this and sometimes get people around, it's amazing when that wee switch goes on, then what happens is they not only become a yes uh, voter, but many of them become yes activists, right? So what my question is, is this, this fund that we've, this sort of war chest that we've talked about for the, the, the yes uh, program, um, what, do you, what do you think is the best way in which to use that money? Because at the moment, I'm just, the, 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 the poster campaign, the first one that we up there, I, I thought it was just like an advert for RBS or something, really. I didn't think it popped up to good. So, what I'm saying is, 
give you a big idea to have that money to try and target labor, labor supporters, to try and get the grassroots to, to realize this idea about SMP or Alex Okay. Sorry to tell you, I'm sadly I'm a seven seven working in a job centre. And uh, you know, very, very interesting some of the comments Jim made about sanctions. And you know, sometimes when, when you go into a job centre, you deal with that horrendous misery on a day to day basis, you might get the feeling that that's what the work uh, workers in there went through. I have to tell you that that's just a <coughs> Day and day out. The one thing that is absolutely true that Jim has said is that the talent and ability that is there in the Scottish working <coughs> is there in abundance. Day and day out, I deal with electricians, joiners, artists, and um, people that are, uh, are fantastic at dealing with people on a day to day basis. And the best they can do sometimes is get part time work that simply doesn't pay the bills or they cannot get. Any work at all. And I'm absolutely delighted as a socialist and a member of the SSP that the SSP is joining with the ranks of yes, Scotland and Jim Summers and promoting the idea of independence. And I'm also absolutely delighted that tens of thousands of people are warning me that idea. And I think the voice of progress is overwhelmingly inside the ranks of the yes campaign. And I think. That, uh, that wage. I'm just wondering why you're not also focusing 
or making statements about those that are still left unemployed are going to get more money, have a better standard of living when they're working. Why? That's not going to be a massive part of what you're saying. And how, at the same time, when that first day of parliament, how you're not making every business pay the same, and if you've got small businesses that are going to struggle in paying that means, then you say to them, come and talk to us. Instead of being the one of the people that haven't become open their bank accounts, open their life to scrutiny, to be told, right, okay, you are poor, you're dead. Let it be the businesses that come, why not put in the floor for that? Yeah. Thank you. say a few things to you about why I think you need to look beyond the 18th of September to what you're also going to be involved in doing on the 19th of September onwards and in doing so take up a couple of points that have occurred to me from the questions. Now the Scottish Socialist Party as Colin mentioned has existed for 15 and a half years. I actually organised the first ever branch of it in the Hills Trust across the road on one of my many birthdays on the 1st of October 1998 and when we did that and set that party branch up what we made sure was that we were an organisation that took up day to day issues and fought alongside working class people to defend them as well as having a bigger vision and a broader goal of socialism. For example we fought alongside people locally to save their schools from closure by the council on not once but on several different occasions. We also were involved in, believe it or not, a campaign across the road from here to get the council to act on a plague of rats because tenants approached me about that problem in their houses. Now, all the jokes were made about councillors and rats at the time, by the way, so you don't need to add them in. But the point is we took up day-to-day -day issues as well as having a bigger goal. We organised solidarity with the shipyard workers across the road from here. We organised support for the glacier metal workers who occupied the factory in Palmadee and took them into places such as the shipyard across from here. We organised working class international solidarity for the likes of the Liverpool Dockers. And I find it an absolute insult when the Better Together campaign particularly their subcontracted labour wing, who are subcontracted out to do the dirty work for the Tories that fund it, when they start talking that independence is a denial of internationalism. Do you think for one minute that those of us who have organised support for Nigerian trade unionists who are persecuted by their government, or Danish bus workers, or Liverpool dockers, or Manchester care workers, or Irish uh, glass workers, or anybody else, 
do you think will suddenly change genetically and be reprogrammed to become petty little nationalists who don't care about people who live the other side of a border? It's absolute nonsense and an insult to the working class and its fine internationalist traditions in Scotland. Because we fight for independence as a party. And as somebody else said, a lot of people think voting yes is voting for Alex Salmond or voting for permanent SNP government. That is complete nonsense. Some of the same people in the Labour Party who argue that line and constantly push it made their name out of arguing for majority rule in South Africa against the apartheid system. What we want is majority rule in Scotland in the future, instead of being dictated to by the Tories who were not elected by the Scottish people on any single occasion since 1955. Not once has there been a Tory majority vote in Scotland since then, and yet we've had at least 34 years of open, unadulterated Tory rule in the 70 years since then through the Westminster system. And what I'm appealing to is not just the stark choices you face on the 18th of September, of voting no to the continuation of the sanctions that means I met a woman at Govan Cross who had lost 35 sanctions because she did voluntary work and was late to turn up for her voluntary job on one occasion. Or the, the people who are living on the bones of their backside, to use a polite version of the phrase, who, for example, today, a young lad who's done voluntary work for orphanages in other countries, dead keen to work and couldn't afford to come to the meeting tonight because he lives in Pollock and unless the weather's good enough, he couldn't face cycling here because he couldn't afford the fare to get to the meeting. That's the kind of society that will continue and it will get worse if we vote no by majority on the 18th of September. If we vote uh, yes, it doesn't mean everything falls into place perfectly literally on the 19th, but it bangs the door open to shape your own future. And that's the point I'm trying to focus on, shaping your own future. Because the white paper that's often trotted out and often criticised by the Better Together campaign has many measures in it that the Scottish Socialist Party would completely endorse, and in some cases we actually pioneered them. But it's the vision of one party and one only, the SNP. We totally support their call and promise for childcare for three and four year olds, vulnerable two year olds and so on, which would enhance the lives particularly of women and also create a guesstimated 35,000 jobs in the, the process. Scrapping the bedroom tax, scrapping Trident, ending Tory dictatorship over Scotland, all those are desirable ends and voting yes is a means to that end. But the SSP goes a lot further than that, as Colin and, and other speakers have described. We want, for example, to abolish the whole battery of anti-trade union laws, which hamper the ability of people like me as a trade union convener, or my predecessor who spoke from the floor earlier on in the same workplace. We want a society which allows the trade unions to function with full trade union rights from day one of employment, and that is a right, not some kind of on-the-ground privilege to join a union and face the possibility of being victimised and demoted if you dare to do so. We want the powers also to bring industry and energy, including renewable energy, into public ownership so that instead of it making a Klondike for overseas multinational companies and landlords who get a fortune for giving a bit of their land for a few pylons and wind turbines, instead of that ripping off of natural energy, we want it in the hands of the Scottish people so that you could have clean, green energy in a socialist Scotland in the future. And yes, we want to redistribute wealth radically. We want to end the system where a hundred richest people in Scotland today have more in combined wealth than the entire budget for the Scottish Government in Hollywood. A hundred people have £39 billion pounds in wealth, well beyond the £30 billion odd that the Scottish Government have to hand out in different services for five and a half million of us. That is an obscene inequality in this day and age. We want to end that. And some of the many measures we would advocate for that is a decent living wage. Yes, for the public sector, but also for the private sector, for everybody. And we believe it should be based on some such formula 
we're not fixated with this, but it's a good enough starting point, such as two thirds the average wage that a man gets in Scotland, which today would mean a national minimum wage of over £9 an hour. And we think pensions should be based on the same, and benefits should be vastly increased based on the same redistribution of wealth within the society. And I want to finish by appealing to you to think of this. If you agree with some of the aims that Jim has spelt out, that Carolina, Caroline and uh, Colin have spelt out, or some of the things I've mentioned, if you agree with those, we're not going to get it on a plate by begging for permission. We're going to have to organise to achieve that. We're going to have to organise not just for independence, but for socialist change. And there's many examples in history with associations with government which makes this simple point. The point being that nobody on their own, however heroic, however talented, however determined, nobody on their own can change the world. Individuals can play a key part in changing and shaping our future, but only if they have an army around them. For example, Mary Barber did not fight the landlord system in the First World War and defeat the rent rises by herself. She had an army of women campaigning and defying the, uh, the factors and the landlords were screwing the working class whilst their men were being killed in the trenches in the First World War. Jimmy Reid didn't save the Upper Clyde shipbuilders on his own. There was an army of workers occupying the yards and saying, we're not moving, we're not giving in, we're fighting to protect the future of ourselves, our kids and our grandkids. The anti-poll tax movement, the anti-bedroom tax movement, both of which the Scottish Socialist Party was at the heart of and at the head of, was consistent of an army of volunteers of ordinary people combining together, uniting and defying the government and beating those iniquitous uh, taxations of the working class people and the very poorest. And what I'm asking you to consider is don't just vote yes. It's not a vote for Alex Salmon unless you choose to make it that after the referendum. It's a vote to determine your own future, to control and ensure majority rule in Scotland for the working class of Scotland who make up the majority. And within that, there will be a socialist option. The so Scottish Socialist Party has never gone away anywhere in the last 15 years. We're never going to go away in the future either. We are here to stay, we're here to fight, we're here to organise. And my appeal to you is to do two simple things tonight. One is if you've got any spare change, give generously to the collection to help to cover the cost of this meeting, which in total was about £350, print cost, room and so on. Give what you can. But secondly, and more importantly still, consider becoming part of that organised army for socialism. Join the Scottish Socialist Party. See if the dinners at the desk at the end and become part of a proud force that will shape Scotland's future for socialism and shape it into a country that looks after the millions and not looks after the millionaires. Thanks for listening. Okay, I'm just going to be asked to talk in uh, a couple of minutes. One of our speakers seems to have disappeared in the line. There you are. Uh, could you come back up just for a, a couple of minutes? Uh, and we'll take it in the, the order that we had before. So you have it first. I just say, um, vote for independence, couldn't be any worse off than we are now. <laughs> Richard just said everything I was going to say. Um, but to go back to, there was a gentleman down there that said um, he didn't think he would see a social Scotland in his lifetime. Can I just say, five years ago, I didn't think we... <laughs> I didn't think we'd see an independence referendum in my lifetime, and we've got that now. So we've got an opportunity to take a step forward towards that socialist vision. I don't expect to wake up on the 19th of September. I know I'm going to be hungover anyway, but on the 19th of September and wake up to this socialist utopia. 
that's just the beginning, that's where the hard work starts and I hope after listening to all the arguments and debates um, tonight that you will take part in, in bringing that social discussion forward. I also have to say, um, for a few years I was um, discouraged by politics um, for a whole number of reasons, but the Yes campaign has really galvanised me again. The reason for that is because of the, um, the number of people that are involved. I mean, I never thought that I would see a Labour councillor in an SSP meeting that actually agreed. Former Labour councillor actually in a SSP meeting agreeing with most of what we're saying. So I'm, I'm encouraged and heartened by that. Um, what, um, the opinion polls are closing. It's within our grasp. If everyone that, that intends to vote yes, if half of those people can convince one other person to vote yes, when we wake up on the 19th of September, we might not have a social utopia, but we'll have an independent Scotland, and I really hope that happens. say that I think Caroline is absolutely right. I, thought, I hope everybody here is encouraged as we are. This is another terrific meeting that the Scottish Socialist Party, I think Bill mentioned at the beginning of his remarks, the SSP has organised meetings across the length and breadth of the country. Like tonight, my colleagues for Yes Scotland will tell you that every single day of the week, right the length and breadth of Scotland, there are meetings taking place like this, town halls, village halls, communities the length and breadth of Scotland. And I was reminded of that when one of the colleagues asked the question about the media. And of course, we're constantly trying to get the media to accurately reflect the nature of the issues that are involved in this debate. But as you well know, there isn't a single media outlet in Scotland which has come out in favour of independence. That's a fact. Yet, what's also a fact, and Carolina reminds us, 44% of people in Scotland are saying they're going to vote yes already without any of the media's uh, support. And I think that's a remarkable tribute to yourselves. And if you'll allow me, I think it's a remarkable tribute to the phenomenal grassroots Yes Scotland organisation that has been built over the last 18 months up and down the country to counteract the Daily Record, the Daily Telegraph, the Scotsman, the BBC, the radio, television channels, etc. And it reminds me very much Indeed, of 25 years ago, Thatcher brought in the poll tax. We were constantly told it was the law, you had to obey it, you couldn't possibly defeat it, you couldn't possibly defy it. And I know, in fact, I remember it, the Labour Party had a conference in Govan and decided to tell the people of Scotland it was the law, you had to obey it, and you had to wait for a Labour government in five years' time to get rid of the poll tax. And I'm proud to say, Proud to say this to you, proud to say this to you, that the people of Scotland were wiser than that and they decided to launch a very effective campaign, which is we can pay the poll tax and we're not going to pay the poll tax. And 16 million people across the length and breadth of Britain did so. And I remind you of that simply because in subsequent years, increasingly I think since last year, since the death of Thatcher, all of us involved in the anti poll tax campaign had to listen to the garbage that it was some Tory backbenchers or some parliamentary coup that got rid of Thatcher's government. It was the 16 million people in Govan and London and Birmingham and Motherwell, the length and breadth of Britain who brought her to her knees, wrecked her flagship policy and ruined her government. And it's a good illustration of the power of working people. And so is the Yes Scotland campaign. Because the Yes Scotland campaign is the most successful grassroots campaign Scotland has seen since the anti poll tax struggles 25 years ago, and I think that's remarkable. So I take off my hat, and I hope you do take off your hat to what's been achieved so far, but only insofar as you realise there's six months to go. And I agree with the colleagues who've said it before. My feeling since the very beginning is this poll is going to be in a knife edge. This is going to be very, very close indeed. We're seeing the polls coming together, and my anticipation is they'll continue to narrow and narrow and narrow. 
right down to September, and there's nobody in the Yes Scotland campaign in the length of the breadth of the country is going to let up feeling that either the job is done or the job can't be won. We walk right to the, the 11th hour, as it were, and I think that's a remarkable achievement. If I can see this, I've got a very important question. The first question was asked about how does the supporters for independence show solidarity with the English working class and the English working class and the poor? And I say to you, I speak at meetings up and down the country, and I make this point absolutely clear. The independence for Scotland benefits working class people through the length and breadth of these aisles. It benefits working class people in Scotland, it benefits working class people in England, in Wales, in Northern Ireland, it benefits working class people the world over because the British state is at the epicentre of a neoliberal, exploitative, warmongering machine that doesn't just exploit us, but exploits all of them and independence, securing support for independence is a slap in the puss to them, it's a defeat for them, and it's therefore a celebration of length and breadth of the peoples of the world. And I hope to God that everybody here understands that. And it's our message to the English working class. It's absolutely right. Socialists have recognised, do recognise still today, that dustbin men in Dundee have got more in common with dustbin men in Derby and Dunstable and elsewhere starting with a D than we do with the Duke of Baclou, who also starts with a D. Where's the big D in his hat? The point of the matter is, of course, we have in common that we sell our labour on an hourly basis. But it's not the only factor in politics. Because the same thing we have in common with working class people in England, we have in common with working class people in Latin America, in China, in Africa, in North America and the rest of Europe. That international solidarity is something that's the epicentre of this debate. We don't intend to declare our independence, secure our independence and somehow put up a big steel curtain round about the country. We intend to export the ideas that we have, to celebrate them here and around the world and to show that the people of Scotland have secured their independence. And I want to say this if I can finally, Bill. The Scottish Socialist Party, I hope we've made clear this evening, we're in favour of an independent socialist Scotland, a modern democratic republic. We believe the people of Scotland are sovereign. We're not be having a head of state that's unelected, unaccountable and unrepresentative. We'll have, as Burns rightly put it, we'll he one for a man yourself, a man we trust and all that. And it might even be a woman. Tell that to Robert Burns. The fact of the matter is, we're not having a monarch foisted on us. This is about sovereignty, and the people of this country are sovereign. And the Scottish Socialist Party is proud to stand in front of you today in the Pierce Institute and say, we represent the same tradition that was here and governed a hundred years ago, uttering the words that John McLean uttered and the Red Clydesiders and James Conley in Edinburgh, that we are for an international working class, we want to see the international working class people of the world advance and independence for Scotland is part and parcel of that struggle. It's not in any way whatsoever in conflict with it. That's our objective. We stand proud to be part of that tradition that's been around for a hundred years and we're confident that on the 18th of September we're going to win a famous victory, change this world forever, here in Govan, throughout the length and breadth of the world. In 1979, during the referendum then, I stood at the gates of government shipbuilders and along with me was the man who introduced a Scottish expat, the 40% rule. And I saw these brave government shipbuilders, nor in Abutas, and I made my speech. And George Cunningham was quite brutal. He warned them that they would be punished by the withdrawal of orders if they voted yes, not for a parliament, not for independence, but for one of the mildest assemblies that's ever been offered to people. Now I thought they would pet the heat them, but they didn't. I watched men put their heads down, shuffle their feet, and they were afraid. He had played upon that fear, 
and that's exactly what's been done in this area now. I've got to say this to the Govan shipbuilders, I'm talking about the men. Why is it that you think that an independent Scotland wouldn't it need a fleet of its own, not to sail away and bombard somebody with a cruise missile, but actually vessels that would safeguard our coast, that would stop smoke with our great coastline smuggling in drugs and contraband, as has in fact been done, and have specialist ships which would guard in the North Sea. Why do you think we couldn't do that? I mean, are we too stupid to draw these kind of ships? Are you too stupid to draw these kind of ships? And they say, but where's the money? Well, right now, we pay a substantial amount from Scotland into the Ministry of Defence budget, including Trident. Take that money and bring it back to Scotland and use it to build the ships that we require. And you've got jobs. Exactly the same as we have now. And also, why should you not build hospital ships? Why should Scotland not be a place from which we send people out to heal folk? Now, I've talked about the aircraft carrier, which by the way I would name the Robert Burns, after the greatest humanitarian and egalitarian we've ever produced in this country. But that's Africa and Asia. What about the Caribbean? Haiti? which is devastated time after time. Why can't we contribute there as well? And therefore, where is the problem for governed shipbuilders in an independent Scotland? We've got to pose that to folk. They are working upon the fear as they did in 1979. This time, metaphorically of course, pick the heat them. That's my advice. <laughs> Now, Alex Hammond, the tact, you have to explain, take time to explain to folk who tell you oh, I don't like Alex Hammond and all the rest of it. You have to explain to people that the tactic of the no side is to glue Alex Hammond to independence and make the case, as George Galloway did with me, not against independence but against Alex Hammond. Vote against Hammond and you bring down independence. Alex Hammond is mortal. The nation is immortal. Now, what would happen, do you think, if Alex Salmon get knocked down with a number 24 bus outside my house, the morning morning? They'd be deprived of a major target. So we've got to explain, it's been nothing to do with liking Alec. Nothing to do with him at all. Alex Salmon will be a figure of Scottish history because to give him his dues, he has brought us to the point where we can be sovereign. And he deserves credit for that, no question about it. But we're not being asked to endorse him. It's not an election, and if we get a yes vote, it will not be an SNP victory. If you look at the core vote of the SNP, it's round about 25, 28%. If you add the Greens and SSP to that, we're no near a majority. The majority will be won by the working class Labour vote coming over to the yes side. So it's not a victory for Alex Salmon, Alex Salmon and he won't be able to claim it and will not claim it on the day after. That, we've got to take time to explain that to, to people who, some of them are using it as an excuse, others, for others it's a reason and if it's a reason we've got to explain. As the lady said it's the, down here, it's about the children and the children's children and the future of the, It's a national question, not an SNP or a nationalist question. I was asked about worry about the sort of brutal power of the British state once we become independent and go into negotiations. Well, they've got a lot of experience at dealing with people who want to be independent. But bear this in mind, they've lost every single negotiation they've gone into. And this one is at the lower end of ability of the British state. I was lucky, I went into Parliament in 1970 and there were giants there, on both sides. There's no giants there now. You know, I mean, Cameron wouldn't rate when I went in in 1970. 
Clegg would be raped. Millibank would be left out of court. So we're not dealing with, you know, the brightest and the best of the British state now. But it is extremely important that we think well before the 18th of September what our negotiating position will be. What are our strengths and what are our weaknesses? What are the strengths and what are the weaknesses of Westminster as well? We've got to be prepared long before the 18th September so that we are not caught in the hall by them saying round about the 20th, here's a packet of negotiations. And if you write that first packet, it's a strange thing that happens, all the negotiations are within it. We have to write our chapter to those negotiations. And the lady asked about uh, why I didn't mention unemployment benefit. Well, I can't mention everything. If you read the book, you'll see that I do mention unemployment benefit. It should be, in the first two years, 75% of what the wage was when a person was unemployed. And, you know, if we're talking about full employment, then you're talking about a transitional phase for most people. Because it's, a, well, we live in a technological society. Some industries will die, some industries will rise, and folk will transfer one to the other. It means that a loss of a job temporarily is not a destructive factor financially for the family. <coughs> the banking system, well, my view, I don't live in a utopian or an impossibilist world. We are five million people in a global economy and we are an open economy whether we like it or not. And therefore our banking system and our financial services system is part of that international one. What we can do domestically is divide between what they call retail banking, the normal stuff, taking your money in, keeping it, lending out locally, and the casino banking that brought down bank after bank. You can guarantee folks money in the retail bank, but you then say to the bankers, see on this investment and the casino side, you ain't ever going to be bailed out. If you go down, then down you go. If you believe in a capitalist system that says you fail in the marketplace, then by God, pal, we'll pit you in that market system where you'll fail in, in that particular one. On the oil and the IPCC, I am somewhat sceptical of some of the things said by that international panel. Uh, you look at its track record. It argued the hockey stick, if you remember, which is that there was no change for 10,000 years, basically, in the temperature of the world, and then went up at the end, towards the 20th century, like an ice hockey stick. That was proved to be false, although it was argued three times in their reports. It was also argued about the stuff melting in the Himalayas, which was wrong as well. Now, there's a vested interest in a lot of people making us scared in the pants of us in order that we would invest in certain areas where they will make a profit. Al Gore's swimming pool. Al Gore is a great guru of man-made global warming and lectures all over the world. His swimming pool absorbs more electricity than about 300 houses down the road. So I'm always careful, but I must say this to the young fella, there is no way we can afford to keep that oil resource in the ground. We have got to use it. We've got 21 billion barrels of oil lying in the North Sea. There's oil and gas in the Clyde. We never heard about it. They didn't want us to know about it because if they, we heard about it, we would want rigs there. But if you've got rigs there, you can't sail the Trident submarine safely out of the Firth of Clyde past the Hills of Crane. I believe we've got to use that resource to rebuild our economy and our people at a very, very fast pace indeed. Finally, let me say this. You can strip the issue in the referendum down to one single word. The referendum is about power. Either we have power and exercise it over us, or at one minute past ten, we've given it away where other people will exercise it over us. That, in essence, is the case. Do we want the power 
that we will have between 7 o'clock and 10 o'clock on the 18th September. If we say yes, we want it, at one minute past, we've got it, and when we've got it, that's when we start to use it. I'll bring the meeting to a close by making three appeals. The first is the appeal that uh, the chairperson of one of the joint chairperson of the Yes campaign makes, uh, Dennis Hanivan, when he says if every committed Yes voter convinces one other uncommitted person, we will win a landslide. So it's, it's not just good enough to come to a public meeting and be a committed supporter. You need to get out there and be involved in the campaign because this is something that we can win. If you are interested in joining the Scottish Socialist Party, there are a number of us at the end. If you want to come up afterwards, we're happy to discuss with you. And also make this final financial appeal. Um, there was a complaint by um, uh, some of the, the Best Together campaign that the Yes campaign was cash rich. Well, can I tell you, we're not cash rich. None of that money seems to be filtered down here. Um, so if you can make a donation tonight, anything at all would greatly appreciated. There are no millionaires in our party. Um, all our party our money is self-generated, so if you can make a contribution, uh, please do. Again, thanks for coming to the meeting. It's been really good, the turnout. Uh, as Richie said, we're not going to leave. Uh, we're not going to be anywhere. Um, we'll have far more meetings in government. We're having meetings all over Glasgow, particularly the south side of Glasgow. You're welcome to come along. One final thing, I'd make a point about Jim's book in Place of Fear, which is down there. I think it's price three pounds a bargain. Um, I think Jim will even sign some of the copies for you. So make, make, make yourself available down there. And uh, again, thanks for coming to the meeting.